on the African continent in particular, we have realized that the traditional notion of the first generation of SSR or the concept of SSR itself needs to be re-examined to feel the new nature of security challenges on the African continent. And so one of the things I was very impressed with the African security sector reform program was the thematic area, the sessions around how do we do SSR within a stabilization environment, particularly reflecting on the, ARA, the issues with the Arab Spring, issues around international terrorism, issues around insurgency. Because in the new, in the 1980s and 90s, the nature of the threats to peace and security on the continent were more from revolutionary movement, rebel movement, which were resolved based on peace agreement, negotiating peace agreement. And where there is no political negotiated settlement with extremist groups such as those we have on the continent, which obviously many people know we are challenged with Al Shabaab, we are challenged with Boko Haram, we are challenged with Al Qaeda in Madrid, Al Qaeda on the peninsula. So it means that we need to think about a second generation of security sector reform that can respond to the needs of the people to mitigate the threats uh, along. Uh, transnational organized crime that emanate from there. And therefore I see that uh, a state-centric approach, um, which, is, which is notion around the peace-building paradigm, is not sufficient on the African continent. And the second reason is that it's clear that who are the, in terms of demand and supply, who are the main service providers? On the continent, honestly, I will tell you in my village, everyone knows 60% of security service and access to justice whether in Somalia, whether in Sierra Leone, whether in Libya, whether in Mali, they are provided by informal actors. And so we need to reflect on the concept of security sector for whether it is really sufficient to address the need of non-state security actors. And therefore, my recommendation, as I alluded during the conference, was that practitioners, academics, and donor community need to reflect on security sector reform concept that meets the needs of human security and citizen security that reflect on post-millennium development goal in 2015 and above. I see security sector reform, and our simple definition for me, from a layman or a practitioner, it is really about the transformation of structures, institutions, and processes to interact, whether at the community level to the National Security Council. My experience in terms of early warning and threat analysis, whether it is biological weapon like Ebola has happened to my country now, the thing is, are the structures and institutions that will respond to community threat analysis, are they at the border? Remember, most of the donors in after peace agreements and that, we are heavily concentrated in urban centers. You are in Sierra Leone, you know what I'm talking about. But if you go to Kailan district, where the villagers are there, the threat on the border, what are the political economy there? How effective is the district security committee in Kailan? How effective is the committee itself working on community threat analysis? If that community which should work at civil military relationship, creating the political space for even local authorities and informal groups to serve, is not effective, it's not working, we can't support that. So that state building and peace building, security sector reform can be done from below. Then we are problematic because we need to close the gap between local governance and border security, which we as security sector as a concept, moving towards second generation can solve that problem. There are a few tools we, 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 we now um, we need to think through. You know, like I said, for example, one of the, the, the tools I have been practically involved in developing is about defining roles and responsibility at the community level. What can the formal institutions do, like my office is standing here as a major, and then what can the local militia groups based on clan and tribe do? The thing is, you have to define that too through a standard operational procedure. If you have a community-driven standard operational procedure, how the interaction, defining roles and responsibility between formal and informal state actors 
including civil society. I think that is the way to go so that along those lines they can collectively analyze what we call community threat analysis and early warning system, which are really the essence of informing rational executive decision on security sector reform issues. So I think in a stabilization environment, SSR can be very useful as, 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 as a tool for confidence building to address the immediate political needs to lay the foundation for long-term sustainable SSR program, which is all about the SSR. But we need the principles, we need SSR to help us to establish structures, institutions, relationships that can interact between international stabilization force and local forces. So that within that process, once they build trust and confidence between an international stabilization force, like my troop, the Sierra Leone Republic of Sierra Leone Army in Somalia at the moment, they're doing extremely good because they have developed a CIMIC approach. And that is very useful for, for, for us to draw le practical lessons from that, to inform theory and policy, so that we can look at SSR with not a state-centric approach, but from a second-generation approach, looking at the importance of social capital and cultural identity in influencing uh, uh, the, the, the activities we do in the stabilization environment. And that can lead to economic, uh, it can lead to humanitarian. The, I mean, you cannot do, uh, for example, do we need security committees in Kismayo? In Somalia context, for example, can we start state-building SSR normative framework from above in Mogadishu, or do we need to go start from Putland, Somaliland, and then the lower Juba, and then and below? And this we have to lead to the federal and constitutional review process as well.